Hello. Well, hello everyone. Uh, to those who came here, and I'm also transmitting this on Twitch in case someone chooses not to come. Um, yeah. So the idea for this short session is mostly to discuss the answers to the midterm questions. And yeah, I don't think that will take too long. And afterwards, we can, yeah, I'll stay here to uh, help with the uh, questions about the uh, lessons or homework two. Um, yeah, regarding homework one, I think Ravi is already writing it. So it should be up in a few days. Um, Yeah, so let me move this a bit higher. So, um, yeah, I think the if you look at the average of um, the midterm exam, it was like a 60 something percent. I mean, it's not great, uh, but the main purpose of the midterm exam was just to help you prepare. Uh, so, so you can know what sort of questions are expected, more or less for the final exam as well. It's only worth five percent, so um, yeah, just be aware of um, the sort of topics you know, the sort of topics you don't know, and maybe have a second look at how you're looking at the lessons. Um, yeah, so the first question was looking at the 3D model on the cover of the 3D book, so this image shown here and you were supposed to give uh, three examples so one sentence talking about the geometry of the model one about the topology of the model and one about the semantics of the model i marked as, um, this as correct as long as you did more or less what, what was what was expected a lot of you didn't really mark the questions so i sort of had to guess which ones were which um, some of you sort of mixed uh, the different parts together in like a single sentence as long as it was clear uh, like what topics you were referring to that was okay um yeah so as you can guess there are many many possible answers to this sort of a uh, question i think something easy to say would be uh, about the shape of the cubes um uh, for instance, this is a voxelized model. It's composed of cubes, uh, something like that for the geometry. You could say something about the sizes of the cubes. Like, I think I told you that this was with a 10 meter wide uh, voxels. Um, you could say something about the size of the overall model. Uh, what is the extent? Uh, about the area that it covers, something like that. Uh, for the topology, you could talk something about the connectivity, like what is the connectivity between the cubes? Like if you did voxelization here, can you guess if this is like, a, I don't know, like a six connectivity or 18 connectivity or uh, 26 connectivity? Um, that was one possibility. You could also just give a more precise statement, like saying that the that the roofs or, or and the rest of the buildings are uh, connected or that they are uh, yeah or something similar with the water or the roads like these are all uh, connected um, yeah you could talk about voxels more in general i think a couple of you didn't use the example all too well so you talked uh, you gave a more generic sentence about voxelization I gave half a point if it was uh, a bit applicable, at least to the model. Otherwise, not really. Like um, there were some answers that were basically copying and pasting parts of the 3D book, talking about topology and not really using this as an example. Um, and yeah, finally about semantics. Uh, I think it was easiest if you just look at the colors and what do they mean. Like you could say like uh, the red uh, represents roofs, the white represents the uh, rest of the building. The blue is the water, uh, something like that, or something more generic, like saying that the 
each voxel has a label or each voxel has a, something that represents what uh, class or what uh, feature you're modeling, right? Um, some common errors that uh, some of you did was mixing the geometry and the topology. I think this was relatively common. Like you talked about uh, cubes, you talk about the number of elements, like a cube is uh, composed of six faces, eight vertices, and you mark that as geometry when it's more about the topology of the cube, right? You're talking about what is surrounding it, you're talking about the number of elements, not where these elements are located. Um, yeah, that was it for question about uh, chapter one. About chapter two, so the main thing was looking at a disk. So if we just look at the um, concept of a disk in mathematics, um, yeah, doesn't really give a good example here. So anyway, a disk is just a filled in circle, right? So the circle is a boundary. Uh, and as you saw in the description here, a disk is just a circle that has uh, been filled in. So it's uh, one single piece. And the uh, question was asking you whether this is a one manifold, a two manifold, or neither. Uh, the key thing was to look at the definitions of a manifold as in the, listed in the 3D book. So a manifold is something that uh, is homeomorphic to uh, the space of a certain dimension. So a one manifold is homeomorphic to a line, a two manifold is homeomorphic to the plane, a uh, three manifold is homeomorphic to 3D space, something like that. Uh, but these are all infinite spaces. So it's not a one manifold is not homeomorphic to a line segment, which goes from point A to point B. It's an infinite line that passes through two points, but goes extends infinitely in both directions. The same goes for the plane. So a plane uh, is not a polygon in space. It's not a, just like a square that sometimes is, is represented. It extends infinitely in all directions. And this is important because when you look at the properties as listed in the 3D book, um, if you go here, like to chapter uh, two, and we provide some examples here, like this example with the coffee cup and the donut. Um, the important thing to note is that we're talking about the, the boundary of these objects, right? We're talking about boundary presentation. So we're not talking about the 3D volume of the coffee cup or the donut, we're talking about the surface that bounds it. And this surface is also, uh, yeah, doesn't have a, a boundary. So the 3D object is bounded by the 2D surface, but the surface doesn't have a clear boundary because it extends infinitely. You cannot find any point on the boundary where uh, it just stops, unlike with a disk. Um, if you have a, this is maybe clear if you look at the, the example shown here. So if we have this polygon, we want to represent it using boundary representation. So the boundary of the 2D polygon is a 1D line. And a 1D line should not have any uh, explicit end, right? So if we are uh, standing on one point uh, here, we should uh, be able to have a line like on both sides of that point. And this example shown here is not a manifold because you can find a point where this is not true. The point shown here. If you look at a disk, it's the same case. So when you're on the boundary of the disk, it doesn't look uh, the same in all directions. On one side, you have the interior of the disk. And on the other side, you have nothing, empty space. So uh, yeah, it's a non-manifold. Uh, some of you got caught by Googling this and ended up in the definition of a manifold with boundary, but uh, it's important to know that a manifold with boundary is not the same thing as a manifold. Um, so uh, one manifold with boundary could be like a line segment, so it ends at a certain point. A two manifold could be like a polygon, so it ends uh, on the boundary. But a uh, one manifold or a two manifold or a three manifold have uh, no ends, they extend infinitely. 
um, yeah, for the marking, I considered it as correct if you gave this full answer, so saying that it was a non-manifold, or if you said that it was a, a two-manifold with a boundary, in case you found that. If you said that it's a manifold, but you gave a reasonable explanation, I gave you half a point, so you, um, yeah, if you argued uh, for the definition and you seem to know like what a manifold is roughly, like homeomorphism to a certain dimensional space, yeah, that was half a point. For the third question about GMAPs, um, yeah, how many darts are there in an octahedron? You were supposed to go to this link. If you wanted to see what an octahedron is, so an octahedron is a um, it is polyhedron. It has eight uh, triangular faces and um, and it has this uh, interior that is bounded by them. There are different ways to approach the problem, uh, but maybe the easiest way is if you uh, spend or some time in the with the homework assignment, homework number one. And then whenever you have um, any phase, you know that within every phase, every edge is composed of two darts. Right? So, if you look at the octahedron, an octahedron has eight faces, eight triangular faces. So, there are six darts per face. Multiplied by eight, you reach 48. Um, if this figure was not super clear, you could also just look at uh, yeah, the description like saying that it has like eight faces. Um, each one is made of a, of, of a triangle. Um, yeah, so common errors here. I think if you have not understood the concept of a generalized map too well, you might have uh, looked at the um, at this uh, representation of the simplices that is equivalent to tetrahedra in 3D, so this sort of thing, or um, triangle, the yeah, of triangles in uh, 2D, so this representation here, and then you're assuming that a dart is just a triangle or a dart is just a tetrahedron, uh, but it's not, it's not just any triangle or any tetrahedron. When you look at these figures, you are looking at a certain decomposition where the like a triangle it means that it has one vertex on the vertex of the figure, one on the edge, one on the face. Uh, so yeah, you cannot confuse these triangles or this tetrahedra for the darts directly. Uh, so these triangles that you see in the octahedron, they're not the same as the triangles that represent darts. Um, yeah. If you got confused there, then I gave you zero points. Uh, but yeah, some of you looked at this figure of the octahedron, and then you sort of guessed that there was some, something going on like inside, that there are like uh, two volumes here. Maybe you saw like uh, there's a, a square face uh, here, like between this point, this point, this point, and this point, and then you assume that these are two volumes, that there's an extra phase, um, that maybe you need to represent like two volumes that are connected to each other. Um, if you arrive at a wrong count with the number of darts, but you explain how you arrived to that count, and then I could guess that this, this was your error. I gave you, I think, uh, uh, two thirds, so like 70% uh, of the mark in that question. Uh, and similarly, if you, uh, yeah, didn't interpret the octahedron correctly, but you know the mechanism for how many darts you have in a certain shape. And yeah, in the question for, uh, yeah, 
session 2.2 about the box cells, you were supposed to look at one figure. Mm. So the figure here. And the idea was that if you look at the voxelized model, here, uh, the question was asking you whether if you stored it, uh, yeah, with a knock tree, you could store some, uh, yeah, you could save some space. And what was the mechanism behind that? Like. The most uh, straightforward answer was that usually whenever you want to voxelize a model like this one, you need to voxelize the entire domain. So not only the object that you see here, but maybe you draw a box around it, and then you split it into voxels, and you need to store everything that is within that box. But here in this example, as in most examples that uh, we're dealing with uh, 3D city models, you have a lot of empty space. Like maybe you have the very, a very tall building somewhere, uh, but in the in large parts of the model, there are no buildings, there are no trees, so you are waiting, wasting a lot of space, um, representing empty space. So uh, with an octree representation, uh, you could save space because, like here, on this side, uh, uh, like uh, on top of the field, you would need to store no uh, box cells. You would do this uh, hierarchical representation only in the places where you uh, have stuff you would need to store it, and in the places where you don't, you would be saving some space. Um, this also applies a bit like to the areas where you have like the trees, maybe, or the terrain, because these are like homogeneous areas where you don't need to split the oak tree all that much. Um, but yeah, this is a bit less of an issue because if you actually notice the, the side views, uh, you will see that, for instance, the terrain is very thin. So, uh, yeah, you need to actually split a lot of, uh, to reach the, like a thickness of one voxel, pretty much. And for the trees, I mean, they it does work a bit, but it's uh, kind of patchy. So it's not like just like a very big uh, uh, volume that is covered by the voxelized trees. Um, but anyway. The main thing was empty space, and a secondary thing was also something about the objects. If you only talked about empty space, that was already a full point. If you talk only about um, objects, um, yeah, yeah, I gave you, I think, a third of the mark. Uh, the idea, the best thing was to talk about both and also to talk about the specific mechanism. Like uh, when you explain your reasoning, you it would be great if you explain like. Uh, this is there's a, this subdivision, and then in the areas where there's nothing, you don't need to subdivide this uh, tree so much. Um, yeah. So the next two questions are from Hugo. Um, the mic is here. Oh, I was wondering. I thought you were cool. Um, yeah, so question 3.1, uh, there were three parts. First one, so you have uh, eight points on the corners of a cube. Corner, sorry for the typo. I don't think it affected one person, apparently. Um, so what is the convex hull? So the convex hull is the cube, it's because I said that explicitly all the other points are inside. But I ask you to describe what is the convex hull. So some people said six faces, but actually you take the points, you tetrahedralize them so that all the faces are triangulated. So the correct answer was 12 faces because every face is triangulated. If you answered six, you got half the points. If you answered 12, you got all the points. If you answered anything else, you got zero. Second part of the question, uh, ta, 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 what is it? Yeah, so how many tetrahedra? So some of you started pretty well. So you start with uh, eight corners, you have a cube, you can tetrahedralize it either five or six, you don't know. Then after that, you insert 12 points incrementally. So what you will do is you will insert one that will fall inside a tetrahedra, then you will split the tetrahedra into four, right? So the same thing as in, I'm going to use that. Uh. 
Okay. Oh my God, you're prepared for that, nice. Uh, so same thing as in 2D, let's say you have a triangulation. If you insert a point here, you will have one triangle, you will split it in three, so it's gonna be plus two in 2D. In 3D, if you have a tetra, if you insert here, you're gonna create three new tetra, and then you're gonna keep one. Not, it, it won't be the same, but let's say the one is gonna be divided into four. So you insert three tetra every insertion. So you could say, I start with five or six, then I insert three new ones every time. So 36 plus five or six. Uh, if you answer that, I think I gave you half the point, but here you forgot that you need to flip for the Delaunay. Uh, in 2D, when you inserted a point and then you wanted to flip, the flips were called flip two, two. That means that if you start with a case like this, you end up with a case like this. You have two tetra, uh, two triangle, triangle one, triangle two, and when you flip them, uh, let's call uh, one and two. So the number stays the same, but here in 3D, as it's explained in the book on the page, uh, I think I can manage to. Oh. If you want it, it's there. Oh, yeah. Where is it? It's uh, to the left, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, the book, the book that was right after. Yes, here. And to make things complicated, the scrolling is reversed from mine. Uh, yeah, so it's there. So if you have a point, you split it, you call it a flip one four, so you go from one to four, from four to one if you deleted it, and then the flips are two, three, and three, two. It means that if you have five points, oh sorry, if you have five points, then if you flip to restore the loneliness, you will go from two to three or from three to two. And you don't control these flips. These flips are depending on how things are located in space. You might say, oh, I have one. Then you decide to, f you decide to flip, you need to flip. So it means that you will either, each flip will add one or delete one. So you don't know what is the total number. That was a bit of a tricky question, but, and it's a big but, uh, in the morning on the chat, someone asked exactly that question. And then my question was already written, obviously, because we're prepared. So I said, yeah, shit, am I ignoring it? <laughs> then I thought, no, but then it's too easy. So then I added the A part and the C part to be sure that it was easier. So that's why I made a mistake, a typo as well with the uh, 1820. But I'm also a bit worried that, so some of them literally copied what was on the chat, what I had answered, and that was a good answer, obviously. I couldn't say anything. But my question is, do you read all the chat, the, 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 the group? In this card, there's really good questions. I'm really amazed by all the questions. I'm not sure if you all read them or if you didn't read it because it was the morning of the exam. But really, I think that you, have high interest in reading the chat there. The answer was there, literally, if you copied it, great. Uh, I don't know who asked it. It was Adele and you, I think, Adele did it before, but okay. Uh, read the chat, ask question in the chat. I think that was a pretty good example of why that helps for the exam. Uh, and the third question was, uh, oh yeah, that almost virtually everyone had it that was in the book. So if you have 18 incident tetrahedra, so the dual of a tetrahedra is a point, so that meant 18 points, and uh, 28 edges, so that means 28 faces. And yes, a Voronoi cell is always convex by definition. So uh, some people went, yeah, if they're unbounded, they're not really convex. Yeah, they, okay, they're not closed, but they're still convex because no, if you extend all the planes, they will never um, cross, let's say. So, but that everyone got it. Everyone, not everyone, but most people. 
Uh, and then the second question was, um, can you show me the, uh, I don't know what the, the figure, sorry. Sorry, but I'm just one person, because I didn't know this C. You didn't, you didn't know what, sorry? I didn't see that C in the exam. Yeah. There weren't any new lines, but I just somehow missed it. Yeah, okay, yeah, I noticed that. Uh, we will format it better next time. Yes. I know he means uh, question 31C. He forgot to answer it. He just wrote A, B, and then there was nothing. The one with the incident is rapid. Um. Yeah, so question, uh, I don't know what's the name of the question, question six, I guess. So we want to represent the tetrahedron with four faces. Is it a valid solid? Uh, I got, well, maybe two thirds of good answers, I would say. Uh, the answer is no, because it doesn't fulfill all the requirements. So uh, it's watertight, uh, there's no insert section, there's no hole, there's no cracks, there's no nothing, it's good. but the part where it fails is the orientation. So it was written in the book that every surface should have a, should be oriented uh, counterclockwise from outside. So then you needed to go check um, and then see if they're counterclockwise. Uh, I would think I wrote it, yeah. So basically, um, they were not oriented correctly. So the last face, uh, the last surface, surface four, B, C, D, is oriented counterclockwise. And one way to do it, that was also a question on the chat, uh, what is right hand versus left hand? It doesn't really matter. It's like in 2D, if you want to enumerate triangles, usually we, or polygons, we use counterclockwise. So when we order something, we do it counterclockwise. Why? Because when I learned it, people did it counterclockwise, so there's maybe a man or a woman 50 years ago that decided by convention we use counterclockwise and that's it. But if you say me and my code, I really like clockwise, I'm really a clockwise person, there's nothing wrong with that, just that you need to change maybe all the formulas that we give you, but clockwise or counterclockwise doesn't really matter. For if you want to store internally what you have, but the international standards say that if you store a solid, the faces, when you look at them from outside, they should be oriented counterclockwise. And one way to remember is to use the right-hand rule. So if you see BCD, let's say the face that's there, you curl your finger, then your thumb is pointing outwards, which is also counterclockwise. So BCD is correct. And then if you look at the first one, ABC, which is the bottom one, so uh, the bottom one, if you do ABC, you see my normal is pointing oct upwards. So then if you look under, then you say, oh, I'm clockwise. So this one is wrongly oriented. So the first, the second, and the third are all oriented in the wrong orientation. So the solution to this problem was to flip one, two, three, and keep four. Some people said, because there's another rule also that says that oh, the orientation should be consistent. So I could have tricked you. I also thought of doing that final exam question. All the normals are pointing inwards. So if I had put uh, one, two, three like this, and then uh, question, uh, surface four, B, C, D, if I had said I'm gonna reorient it um, consistently with the other one, so I do B, D, C. So B, D, C would be like this. Then you could say this solid is still invalid because uh, all the surfaces are oriented correctly, but they're all pointing inwards. If you look from outside, all the surfaces are clockwise, and you want them counterclockwise. So then you would have had to flip them all. But now they were, some of them were in and out. So if you wanted to start that with uh, the D cell, you learned that in Geo 1002, one of the standard GIS edge-based data structure, you would be in problem to start that because, for example, the edge BD would be twice in the same direction. While if you start everything counterclockwise, it will be there once in one direction and the other time in the other direction. Clear? And 
Oh yeah, the last question. Uh, if you want to store that as a multi-surface, multi-surface, the standard just say it's a set of surface and I don't care how they interact. They just need to be flat. So since they're uh, planar, so since they're triangles, yes, it was valid as a multi-surface. They can touch, they can be disconnected. It's just one bucket, one set of surfaces. That's it. Any question about the questions? How about the images? Because uh, in the previous book, there is an example that <coughs> the interior of the cell is three months old. So uh, the interior of the disk is also two months old, right? The interior of what? The interior Tur of the disk is two months old. The interior of the disk? Um, well, it's not uh, manifold because even if you look only at the interior, it has a boundary. Because there is an example in the book that uh, the interior of the Earth is 3D, sorry, 3 manifold. Yeah, I think. Specify that the interior of the Earth is kind of suggested by this. I think we might have some inconsistent definitions a bit. Uh, do you know where that is? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the maybe that should be changed to three manifold with a boundary. <laughs> but uh, okay. Um, I will review the answers a bit and be a bit more lenient with that uh, question, I think. It's a fair thing to do. So what, what would be the difference between uh, what was described in uh, 1.2 and a, a sphere that has been filled in, like, a, like just a ball? Um, yeah, so uh, uh, disk should be a uh, two-manifold with a boundary. and. Uh, the earth should be a three manifold with a boundary. With a two manifold Sorry? With a two manifold boundary? With a two manifold boundary. Just like a disk has a one manifold boundary. Because uh, if you look at the disk and the boundary, so the circle that surrounds it, it doesn't have a start or end, it just goes around, right? And if you look at the, the earth or like, um, uh, yeah, when you look at the, the earth, you are mathematically talking about a ball. Like a, a ball is to a sphere, like a disk is to a circle. So it's a filled in uh, sphere. And then the boundary, it's a two manifold because also it doesn't have any uh, edge on it, right? You can go around the earth and you never uh, reach any discontinuity. In a disk you would? In a disk you would, if you look at the two manifold, so it's a two manifold with a boundary. Uh, but if you look at the boundary of the disk, it's a one manifold with no boundary. It's just a one manifold. Any other questions? Okay, well, um, thanks, and I'll stay here in case you have any questions about the lessons or homework number uh, two, I think. Questions about the homework number two might be better oh, to Hugo, since he's in charge of it. But. <laughs>